Well, good morning, or good afternoon, or good evening. Uh, Welcome to our service of worship whenever and wherever this finds you. For those of you that I haven't yet met, my name is Reverend Heather Weaver Oros, and I serve here at Trinity Beamsville along with my colleague Cassandra Matthews, and we're really, really glad that you can be here with us today. Through the service, you're also going to hear the musical gifts of our music director, Andrew Popes, as well as our soprano, Melanie Hugel. And as always, we are very grateful to have their leadership in this service as well. The service that we have prepared for today is trying to cover a few spaces of the heart all at the same time. I I think they're going to work together into one uh, wonderful whole. For many of you, today is celebrated as Mother's Day, and so whether that is you being celebrated or we are celebrating the mothers or the grandmothers or the the mother figures in your life, this is a time when we honor and celebrate uh, the life that you give and uphold, and we say a very sincere thank you. We're also lifting up in thanks that this is uh, in the Christian context and certainly in the United Church of Canada, we pay close attention to this as Christian Family Sunday. And we lift up all the many beautiful configurations that can be family and kinship. And so we honor that as well with our songs of praise. We're also taking some very intentional steps to honor and celebrate International Nurses Day, which happens every year on the 12th of May. And I'm a little embarrassed to tell you that prior to this year, I could not have told you that that is true. It is one of those annual days that probably gets a little bit lost along the way, were it not for other wise folks who bring that to my attention. We don't want that to happen this year for a few reasons. Uh, This May 12th happens to be the bicentennial of the birthday of Florence Nightingale, for whom, um, or in whose honor, I guess I should say, International Nurses Day is named on May the 12th. This also happens to be the International Year of the Nurse and the Midwife, and so we want to give thanks for that. And of course, most poignantly, this time of pandemic has really brought to the fore again the truth about our dependence on healthcare providers and particularly our dependence on all in the nursing profession who give their lives for our care and our strength and growth. So that is what and whom we hope to lift up in all of these ways of thanksgiving today. Last but not least, we are moving into week two of an extended worship series on the soul of a pilgrim. Please don't fret if this is the first time you're hearing about this. This is not meant to be the kind of series that you can't pick up right from where you are, so don't worry. Um, The inner journey, the faith pilgrimage that we are trying to talk about through this series is a whole with many, many parts, and so you don't need to You just don't need to worry about there being a linear progression and that you have missed out on something along the way. So above all, I pray that you hear and you know this day as an opportunity to celebrate all that this lifelong journey holds for us and through it all, remembering that we are never, ever alone. We are gifted with one another that we might care for one another. So let us lift up all of that in praise and thanks to our God. Let us prepare our hearts and our minds for worship.
We come to this sacred time as individuals, in family units, in neighbors, as friends. We come into God's presence where we are known by name, welcomed as we are with all our fragilities and strengths. We gather in spirit with kindred spirits who long to live faithful to God's calling. We come to be guided and inspired, challenged and comforted, nurtured in this time of worship that we might return to our daily lives transformed and ready to engage fully with creation. Come and let us worship our Creator God, our loving parent. Let us unite our hearts in prayer. Holy One, there is a special mysterious bond that keeps us connected, an invisible umbilical cord uniting creator with created. You are always near as a mother whose heart beats in her child's chest, who knows our every step, wipes our every tear, is there to catch, us, to catch us when we fall and invites us to grow more into your likeness and wisdom. As we gather today, we give you thanks, O God, for all who mother and nurture us in your name, for health care providers who have nursed us to health, for chaplains and spiritual leaders who have helped us to make sense of life's struggles, for mentors who have modeled values, for families who have helped to form our character. We pray that you would send your healing love into grief or pain that lingers this Family Christian Sunday. Open our hearts and increase our passion toward all who suffer. May we grow ever more deeply rooted in your love, that we may answer your call to be the leaders mentors, 
family members you have created us to be. We pray all of these things in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, Mother, who is in the heavens, may your name be made holy. May your dominion come. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today the bread we need and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And do not put us to the test, but rescue us from evil. For yours is the dominion and the power and the glory forever. Amen. again this week and we're back all uh, for all of this service in the sanctuary but I am here today um, with some friends of ours sort of some people that you may or may not recognize based on the pictures that I have here of them um, this is uh, our way all together of honoring International Nurses Day which is on May 12th of every year and so we asked, this is at the, um, the great wisdom and the inspiration of our Sandra Romanoli, who said, what if we asked all of the nurses that we know of, we, we apologize in advance, we've probably missed some people who serve as nurses in our community from our congregation, but we tried to catch as many of the people as we could. And I reached out to them and I said, could you send me a copy of your graduation photo from when you finished your nurse's training and just tell me the year that you graduated and from where? And we had a wonderful, wonderful response and so I thought I would show you or tell you who some of these folks are before we go on. I have a little bit of a cheat sheet because I will not remember all of this. So this is in order of graduation. So this is Doreen O'Neill, but we know her as Doreen Stokes, and she graduated in 1951 from Toronto Western Hospital School of Nursing. Over here, it says Valerie Bowie. We know her as Val Adkinson, and she graduated in 1954 from the Mac Training School for Nurses at St. Catharines General Hospital. Up here, we have a photo of Joan Shave, who is now Joan Smith, and she graduated in 1961 from Guy's Hospital School of Nursing in London, England. And then over back here, we have Carolyn Crown, who is Carol Berg to us, and she graduated in 1964 from St. Joseph's Hospital School of Nursing in Hamilton. Way over here, we have to me, she's the Reverend Judy Bowman, but then she was Judy Jameson, and she graduated in 1965 from Toronto East General Hospital School of Nursing. Over here is Janet Morlock, who is now Jan McLennan. She graduated in 1966 from Woodstock General Hospital. Over here is Marilyn Hay. She graduated in 1971 from St. Michael's Hospital in Toronto. And then we're going to go down here for where we start to get into some color pictures. Here we have Owen Romanoli, who graduated in 1975 from the University of Windsor. We have Sandra Weiss, who became Sandra Romanoli, and she graduated her first training in nursing in 1977 from Niagara College. 
over here is Jackie Richardson, who is Jackie Lease to us. She graduated from Humber College in 1984. We have Loretta Paskett, who graduated from Mohawk College in 1996. And last but not least, right here in the middle between her parents, this is Sandra and Owen Romanoli in 2015, as they stood together with their daughter, Caitlin Romanoli, when she graduated from Duville College as a registered nurse. So that's just a bit of an assortment. We know that there are others that we, we just honor and celebrate, and we're so blessed to have them in our congregation because it is entirely true of most vocations, but especially nursing, once a nurse, always a nurse. We rely on them. There are many things you might notice that they share in common, especially in some of the, the first pictures through here and even up through here, in terms of maybe some of the more traditional nurses' uniform that they had, especially for their graduation. Um, something else they would have had in common or do have in common is something called the Florence Nightingale Pledge. It's kind of, as I understand it, it's, it's their version, a nurse's version of the Hippocratic Oath where they pledge when they receive their nursing pin. Um, beautiful language about how they will live and move as nurses called to serve in this profession. Um, it's based on the language and the work of a woman named Florence Nightingale who was born 200 years ago, but really changed the face of nursing and medical care. And one of the things she's known to have said, I really want you to know this, is she said, God called me in the morning and asked me, would I do good for God alone without reputation? And that seems so entirely fitting of all of these nurses and how I know them to work. There is one thing, though, that I've learned in these last number of months that um, it's quite different for one nurse in particular who is facing something that none of these other nurses have in their lifetime in this way. And that is Caitlin, right down here. She's a nurse. She's working full time and I'm going to show you a picture where she looks a little bit different than this. So inside here is what she looks like now when she has to go to work and it's hard to look at. It makes my heart a little bit sore to think that this is the scary place that she has to go into every day in the sense of, you know, to keep her safe and well and to protect the patients that she cares for. And yet it also brings me great comfort that the hospitals are not scary at all because we have people like Caitlin who are going in and doing everything that they can to serve. But Caitlin also does something else extra special. She wears on the outside of all of her gowns and, and her protective equipment she wears this, it's a badge, and it says, Caitlin, registered nurse, I am Nurse Caitlin, I look like this. And then it's repeated in Spanish, and it's repeated in Arabic, in case this is easier for her patients to read. Because she wants them to know that inside this is this, that this is who they really are being cared for. And this is what she brings to them. Every time she comes, she comes with compassion, which is a big word, which means she comes to be with them right where they are in everything that hurts and everything they don't understand. So this is why I call this whole celebration today, this whole honoring, I call it angels in disguise. Because while this might seem like a very special, unique disguise right now. In some ways, every nurse who was there in their uniform, they're wearing not a disguise, but they're wearing something that identifies them as a nurse. But inside, this is who they are. They are God's angels who are there doing such, such important work for all of us. So today, I really want to invite you to pray for all of these nurses and pray for all of their colleagues, nurses and healthcare providers all around the world who are doing all of their work 
for us to be a safe and whole community again. Please pray for them. Please remember them. Please rejoice in who God has called them to be. So, God has called you to be an angel in disguise wherever you are today, that you too would come alongside people and love them. And why don't we pray about that now too? This is a repeat after me prayer. Wonderful God, thank you for today. Thank you for your love. Thank you for inviting us to love others. May we honor those who care for us. May we learn to be like them as we learn to be more like Jesus. This I pray in his name. Amen. Today's reading is taken from John 14, verses 1 to 14, from the Inclusive Bible. Don't let your hearts be troubled. You have faith in God. Have faith in me as well. In God's house there are many dwelling places. Otherwise, how could I have told you that I was going to prepare a place for you? I am indeed going to prepare a place for you, and then I will come back and take you with me, that where I am there you may be as well. You know the way that leads to where I am going. Thomas replied, But we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? Jesus told him, I myself am the way. I am truth, and I am life. No one comes to Abba God but through me. If you really knew me, you would know Abba God also. From this point on, you know Abba God, and you have seen God. Rabbi Philip said, Show us Abba God, and that will be enough for us. Jesus replied, Have I been with you all this time, Philip, and still you don't know me? Whoever has seen me has seen Abba God. How can you say, Show us your Abba? Don't you believe that I am Abba God, and God is in me? The words I speak are not spoken of myself. It is Abba God living me in me, who is accomplishing the works of God. Believe that I am in God, and God is in me, or else believe because of the works I do. The truth of the matter is, anyone who has faith in me will do the works I do, and greater works besides. Why? Because I go to Abba God, and whatever we ask in my name I will do, so that God may be glorified in me. Anything you ask in my name, I will do. Well, as
as I mentioned in the service welcome, this is week two of our collective exploration in the soul of a pilgrim. The brief summary of what that is all about is that I've been immersed of late in an online, I, I believe I'm in week four, so I'm a couple weeks ahead of us as a whole community, um, in week four of an online community retreat with Christine Valtner's, Balter's Paintner of Abbey of the Arts, which is centered in Galway, Ireland, and then reaches out across the world through cyberspace. So the retreat that I'm doing right now is based on her text of the same name, The Soul of a Pilgrim, and it seemed like a wonderful opportunity, especially at this time in our collective history, that we could make our own kind of retreat together through worship. So toward this concept of an inner journey, of a pilgrimage of the heart, last week was about us hearing and responding to this call to make the pilgrimage in and of itself and to know that God is our faithful companion all through this time. This week is more focused on the early stages of preparing for such a journey and how we must figuratively and perhaps literally accept the practice of packing lightly. And I smile at that because I'm not good at this in any sort of way. So this is not just about decluttering our inhabited spaces, it's about making room in our hearts for the things and for the people that we most need to carry. Most specifically, this is about a practice which allows us to make room for compassion that we might carry both ourselves and all whom God brings into our lives. So, let us begin with prayer. Holy One, I pray that you would give us all that we need to make room in our hearts for you, that your mercy and wisdom would help us to make room for compassion for all your people. This I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So let me start by saying a very sincere thank you to our Sandra Romanoli for doing our scripture reading this morning, and thank you to all of the many, many folks who contribute to these services. Most of them are clearly behind the scenes. We are doing our best to try to incorporate um, other voices, other presence into this time together in ways that remind you that there are more than just a couple of talking heads here trying to hold these services together each week. So this particular week, I made a, a very specific point of asking Sandra if she would do this reading because I know she is a, a, she's a wonderful reader of, of anything, but especially of our sacred text, and also because of her very passionate and lived connection to those many pieces that we are trying to uphold today. Thematically, there is this broad theme of compassion grounded in the celebration of Christian Family Sunday and our honoring of International Nurses Day, Sandra is a crucial connecting point to many families in her role as parent and as nurse. So one informs the other, as I know is the case for every nurse that I know. When I spoke with Sandra about the reading for today, I neglected to say this is not the easiest text. Sadly, John 14, 1 to 14 is both famous and infamous. I think Sandra already knew that. I don't think she would have said no to reading had I explained it all, but there are essentially two things that make it harder in my estimation. So first, this passage is often a text heard at many funerals or memorial services. Hearing it may immediately conjure up images or memories of loss from times of loss. And second, it's a text that is too often, past and present, used in Christian circles to justify a very 
closed and restrictive view of God's love, of who is in and who is out, and the very narrow way that humans might think they get to determine that. In the summary of John 14, 1 to 14, from Salt Commentary, we hear the painful truth that too often this sentence, in which Jesus says that no one comes to God except through him, this sentence is distorted into a dogma of exclusion, as if Jesus is saying, if you're not Christian, you're damned. The commentary goes on to say, This is a dramatic misunderstanding of what Jesus is actually up to in this story. So as in all longings to understand more clearly, context is everything. In this case, the context is what many theologians describe as the farewell discourses of the Gospel of John. In characteristic fashion of this gospel account, John is in the midst of going to great lengths to recount Jesus' final earthly conversation with his followers. Things are about to change radically for Jesus and his disciples. Things are about to take a difficult, very painful turn. And the first followers are about to find themselves in a different space of following. Jesus is trying to prepare them for this time ahead. They will need to rely on what they've known and seen in Jesus to carry it forward without him visibly present anymore. They will need to summon great courage and great wisdom to continue living out God's clear vision of who we are to be, with one another, and to one another. That all sounds well and good and even doable in the presence of Jesus, there to hold us and to guide us. But the thought of living through his death and departure and then living without him, that is anxiety-inducing, to say the least. It is panic-inducing. It is stress on stress. The disciples have been described in this time as disoriented, distraught, unnerved, and afraid. And I think they sound so much like us in times of crisis and suffering. The suffering that surrounds us now is a context that will fill volumes of reflection for decades to come. With unique but equal interest, I believe that social historians, psychologists, economists, epidemiologists, and community planners, to name a few, they will descend on these tomes of compiled data, trying to understand what this time in the human story will do to us. How will it change us for better or for worse, what will we learn and apply? What will we hold tighter? And what will we learn to let go? In her work from 2015, of course, never anticipating this time, in The Soul of a Pilgrim, Christine Walters' painter lays some of the critical groundwork for letting go in her chapter simply entitled, Packing Lightly, taking us deeper into the practice of an inner journey where we travel with God toward the heart of our existence with God, Packing Lightly is a crucial exercise in self-assessment, in life assessment, in faith assessment. It isn't a judging exercise. It is meant to be a freeing exercise in which we prayerfully ask God and we ask ourselves in the process, what are the elements of our lives that weigh us down, hold us back, take up a disproportionate amount of space without purpose and without promise? 
mentally, spiritually, emotionally, physically, what can we set down? What can we set aside even temporarily to see what it feels like to travel through each day without them? What has accumulated in habits over health? What requires so much energy to maintain that we are prevented from giving due energy and due space to where and whom God really needs us to be? Do we pack these things for each day's journey with a view that they would help us to see life's great wonders? Or do they in fact cloud our ability to see and to act with joyful expectation and with gratitude? Do the things we pack, do they take up precious space that we need to live lives of compassion, of suffering with, of loving and living for another? When Jesus is speaking with his first followers on the edge of a time of torment and loss, he does not ask those specific questions that I have just rhymed off. He doesn't name pilgrimage or inner journey or even compassion. And yet I can't help but hear them all through his words of tender guidance and consolation. For even in the midst of a time of parting and sorrow, with a coming time apart, that he does not relish, Jesus speaks with the holy understanding that there is a whole new way of being that will open because of it. As Salt Commentary reminds us, on one level, Jesus, or pardon me, John leans into the broader strokes of describing. Jesus lifting up what will be in the ushering in of the Holy Spirit. For John, they say, the symphony of salvation continues to crescendo with each movement and the rise of the spirited church abiding in Jesus is an even greater phase of God's redemptive work. And on another intricately connected level, This passage is responding to a crisis and revealing the extraordinary care of Jesus in the midst of that crisis. So far from a cerebral lecture on salvation or discipleship or who will get to heaven, this is urgent, poignant pastoral care. Jesus is assuring his companions that his imminent departure is not abandonment, but rather a move that will make way for an even deeper intimacy. It's as if he's saying, on one level, I'm about to leave you, but on a deeper level, we will be closer than ever. Don't worry. Take heart. Trust me. And trust the one who sent me. Jesus is guiding them toward and and modeling at the same time in speech and in action what it means for God's people to know mutual indwelling. It is a flowing of love and mercy back and forth in and through from God to Jesus, with Jesus, and likewise with all of Jesus' followers. Then and now, Jesus' words are offered with this tender-hearted invitation to know the Holy Presence that abides with us and in us, the one in whom we live and move and have our being, chooses to welcome us in, in that same depth of relationship, of relationship, of mutuality, It is mutual indwelling that calls us into the freedom of who we are made and meant to be. We are made and meant to be bearers of God's mercy and love, bearers of the possibility of wholeness, 
of a radically inclusive truth that translates beyond all linguistic barriers or complications. It is at this point in the sermon that I can say my writing process came very close to a screeching halt. Trying to find words and ways to describe or get to the heart of this concept of mutual indwelling, well, I, it wasn't going well. This is one of those vital truths that I really wanted to lift up with clarity, and I was feeling quite stuck in the mud for expression. Fortunately, thankfully, God pushed me to name my struggle for words, to answer honestly when a colleague, a friend, asked how I was doing with the sermon and and how she could help. Her response was both compassionate and wise when I said that I was stuck. And she prodded me to remember this doesn't have to be as complicated as I was making it out to be. Mutual dwelling is both within our linguistic reach and within reach of our daily living. In a word, her answer to me was turducken. In a more nuanced explanation, I give you this living example. In a small border town called Stansted, down near the southern border of Quebec, there is a long-term care residence appropriately called Manoir Stansted. And like countless communities across the country and the world, in early March, the staff of Manoir Stansted could hear these growing and really terrifying reports of the pandemic moving in waves across the most vulnerable sectors of our population. Manoir staff were faced with the crisis of knowing how best to protect the residents that they love, like their own family. Visitors had been restricted entry since March the 12th, but the global reports were suggesting this might not be enough. So their response was swift and sure at tremendous personal sacrifice. In short, the staff moved into the home full-time, 24-7. Thirteen frontline health care workers packed up what they needed and they left their homes and families to truly create the safest, most secure bubble of health that they might offer to those in their care. They dwelled together around the clock for weeks on weeks on end. They became family with and for each other all together, and they did not do so for any seeking of fanfare, but with compassion. In the words of Donna Rolf, who's the assistant director at the home, she said, I'm not doing it for people to thank me. I'm doing it because that's me. These people are people, and they need our help. These people are people, all of them together, and their mutual indwelling brought life. It sustained life. The very heart of this concept of mutual indwelling does not have to be bound up in million-dollar theological terms. It can be known in the living language of compassion, and all of us have our own way to speak that truth. We can begin to come closer to this space of suffering within the most basic and perhaps overlooked activities of the day, right where we are, when we can, in prayer and in song, we can come alongside others. It can be, in the words of Christine Walter's painter's poem, Invite Wonder, it can be something for which we make space in each day's acts of single reverence. This is not about single-mindedness, but a a grace-infused mindfulness that opens us to the possibility that God works in and through the most basic elements of our existence to bring change, to bring hope, 
to bind us and all of our companions in compassion. These are the greater works indeed of which Jesus spoke. In the books we read, in the dishes that we wash, in the food we prepare, in the commitment and the challenge to pack lightly. This is for the sake of our already weary spirits that we might unpack and unload that which holds us back and fills us up with non-necessities. It is a commitment and a challenge to make space for self-compassion that we might then understand and practice compassion for others. In the words of a traditional prayer song from Ghana, each choice in this journey is a prayerful movement with God in which we ask our Creator, help me find myself as I walk in others' shoes. So I'm going to leave it there for today. I'm going to leave this here for you, for your thinking and your praying and your packing and your unpacking until we pick this up again in two weeks' time. I'm going to take next week and go on a bit of a deeper inner journey myself. I'm taking time to catch my breath and to study and to read. I'm going to work on finding myself again, and I pray that you will find that precious time and space too. There will be a service next week. It just won't be in this series. There's something extra special planned for all of you. So that said, the best way I know right now to prepare for this ongoing journey is to offer you the gift of song. It comes to all of us in the form of a virtual choir, which is really the only kind there is right now. But for me, this brings a sacred level of content and caliber. I've listened to it over and over again. This is a virtual anthem. It's offered by Voices Rock Medicine. It's a Toronto-based choir of women physicians. And this is their tribute to the healthcare community the world over. So wherever we are on this pilgrimage, may we all find the space that God gives us to rise again. To God alone be the glory. Amen.
It is an important part of our ministry at Trinity Beamsville to support community care, which we have done for some time. We had a healthy donation that we sent their way in March, and of course things have been a bit of a standstill in the month of April, but uh, even so, we would like to continue and resume our giving to them. And so um, we have, uh, we've got it started, and we, we invite you to continue giving to community care. We have um, arrangements for picking up donations from the middle of our driveways um, on Tuesday the 12th. So if you're uh, available or interested in contributing, uh, we would be glad to make those pickups in a safe way. Um, so you can be in touch with our administrator or have a look at email or website and uh, get all the information that you need for that. We also just, in, in this way as well, you know, even though things have been sort of at a standstill, we've kept going in so many ways and we've found creative ways to do so. One new opportunity that is coming our way right now is um, a chance to have uh, deeper faith conversations about our longings and yearnings, um, about books that we're reading or reflecting on the sermon that has just uh, past recently. So uh, every Monday we'll be meeting at one o'clock via Zoom to have a little bit of a faith discussion. And so uh, you are welcome and invited to take part in that. If you're interested in just a, a faith conversation, we're calling it digital debrief. If you'd like to be part of those Zoom meetings, just be in touch with our administrator, Tanya, uh, and check your email for a link and we'll be sure to get that link to you. We remain so grateful for all who continue to give to the ministries of our church. And so now we will uh, pray over our offering. Let us pray. Generous God, it is with grateful hearts that we bring you these gifts and we ask that they would bless the community abundantly and we ask that you would bless both gift and giver in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.
prayers this morning. What you are about to hear is an expanded and adapted version of a prayer that was written by Sister Joan Chittister as part of the Chautauqua Institute's interfaith family. So like countless other communities of faith, the Chautauqua Institute is attempting to reach out digitally to their many friends and followers to build up hope and strength. So this expanded version of her prayer is meant to honor the wisdom and the words of Joan Chittister while incorporating responses and candles of thanksgiving that really give more specific gratitude for the many, many caregivers in our midst. So most especially today, we are mindful of and thankful for those who serve as nurses all around the world. Let us pray. God of light and God of mystery, give us faith to see you in the gray dimness of this time. Giving thanks for those who provide us with light to see, may we open our eyes to the fullness of your faithful presence in and through all that is right and true. Give us the heart to hear in the silence of the sick, the call to care for those in pain. Giving thanks for those who bind our wounds in all of our complexities, 
May we open our hands to receive all who are before us, knowing you dwell in them with love. Give us the courage to find you where you do not now appear to be. Giving thanks for those who step boldly into the chasms of suffering, may we open our minds to the greater understanding that your perfect love is no match for the power of fear. Give us the trust that it takes to make our way through this uncertainty, this fear, this seemingly irredeemable sense of limitless loss. Giving thanks for those who stay with us with selfless love and compassion, may we rise again to the recognition of the relentless hope that each seasonal cycle of life confirms in us. You who made all things for our good and our growth, Show us, too, now, how to see newly beyond the ephemeral. Giving thanks for those who give of themselves for the sake of our collective healing. Giving thanks for those who give us life, those who save, sustain, and defend life. May we see, hear, feel, and know how to follow your way and your will to what are really the gloriously important things in life. Amen. Amen. blessing and sending forth. Today I bring you a portion, I bring you the second last stanza of a blessing that is written by John O'Donohue in his piece called For the Traveler. It's from his text called To Bless the Space Between Us, which is a, a title that I appreciate so much more now than ever. And it goes like this. A journey can become a sacred thing. Make sure before you go to take the time to bless your going forth, to free your heart of ballast 
so that the compass of your soul might direct you toward the territories of spirit where you will discover more of your hidden life and the urgencies that deserve to claim you. May you travel in an awakened way, gathered wisely into your inner ground, that you may not waste the invitations which wait along the way to transform you. May you know yourself blessed and held and accompanied in your going forth, in all of your comings and goings, in all of your days and nights, with and through and by our great and glorious God. To God alone be the glory. Amen. Never be afraid.